Saul was born in Tarsus between 6 and 10 BC. During his youth, he received vigorous formation in the Jewish law and became an active Pharisee and was witness to the martyrdom of St. Stephen. As an adult, during a journey to Damascus where he was going to persecute Christians, he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus that changed his life forever. From that moment, he took the name of Paul. He began to preach the Christian faith with enthusiasm and went to Jerusalem to meet with Peter, the head of the apostles, and with James to tell them of his new life. He was with them for fifteen days and later went to Caesarea. His letters tell of his travels to evangelize the Roman Empire and of his fervent zeal for proclaiming the Lord Jesus. He died in Rome around the year 67. We have one author who actually knew Jesus' uh, relatives and knew his uh, disciples. And who was that? Paul. How do we know that? Because we have Paul's letters. How do we know he didn't lie about it? Why would he lie about it? Um, well, you, there See, the are, point, the point but there are people, there are, the there Paul, are people, but, but Paul but, says uh, things about Jesus as off-the-cuff comments where he's not making a point. And, see, that's very important to historians. In other words, a historian wants to find disinterested mm -hmm. comments. Right. And Paul has disinterested comments where he says things, for example, about James, the brother of the Lord, which is just an off-the-cuff comment because everybody that he's writing to knows who he's talking about. So he just makes the off-the-cuff comment. That's very important information. Mm -hmm. And that Paul is, an and, and, that, and that is, if, if he wrote them. Disciples. Now, if, why if, if he, he even wrote that. Tough to comment about the 12 disciples if, in, if in fact, uh, I mean, so the whole point is, is that you've got a disinterested comment from somebody who uh, actually knew these people. If he even wrote that, though, correct? Because isn't there some... some no, there's no doubt about Paul writing Galatians. Aren't there some, aren't there some theories that suggest that maybe Paul himself uh, had scribed that wrote for him? Well, did, every, every person who wrote epistles in the ancient world dictated them to scribes. Right. So how do we know, then, that... Well, how do you know Cicero wrote his letters? Uh, I, I don't. I'm not a historian, so I don't, I don't know much about right. Cicero, but... Well, I am a historian, and I'm telling you. But there are some, <laughs> but, but there are many historians who disagree with you, aren't no. they? No, none that I've ever heard of. Oh, really? Well, not serious historians. Not serious I historians. Listen, I know thousands of scholars of the ancient world, and mm -hmm. I don't know any one of these scholars who doubts that Paul wrote Galatians. Okay. So these are people who have devoted their lives to this. And a lot of them mm -hmm. are like me. It's not that I've got a personal investment in Paul. I mean, I'm not even a Christian. Right. I'm just saying, as a historian, there's no doubt Paul wrote Galatians. I mean, I, you know, I've spent 30 years looking at this. this is what I do for a living. So it isn't mm -hmm. just kind of an off-the-cuff kind of comment. This is, you know, I've been examining this evidence for 30 years, reading the, this stuff in the original languages. So it's not like some crazy person who just wants to make money out of a book. I mean, right. I, this, this is what I do for a living, and I can mm -hmm. just tell you that, that everybody who's looked at this thing seriously, there, there's nobody who doubts this. He's, he writes, and I quote, Why then did some of the disciples claim to see Jesus alive after his crucifixion? I don't doubt at all that some disciples claim this. We don't have any of their written testimony. But Paul, writing about 25 years later, indicates that this is what they claimed, and I don't think he is making it up. And he knew at least a couple of them whom he met just three years after the event. This is from his book, Jesus Interrupted, which just came out a month ago. What about the appearance to Paul? He writes, there is no doubt that Paul believed that he saw Jesus' real but glorified body raised from the dead. So again, despite these... We have a record of Paul's travels in the book of Acts. We can compare that history with Roman documents and archaeological findings and determine that the Apostle Paul wrote this first letter to the Christians in Corinth in the mid-50s of the first century. Let me demonstrate how. In Acts chapter 18, verse 11, Paul is described as staying in Corinth for 18 months. Now, in the next verse, we read of him being on trial before the proconsul Junius Aeneas Gallio. 
Gallio is known from non-biblical Roman sources to have only been in this area from A.D. 51 to 52. Thus, we can zero in on the date and have confidence that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians shortly after his stay there, a mere 25 years after Jesus' crucifixion. Corinth had a reputation for sexual immorality, religious diversity, and corruption. The church that Paul planted there floundered under all these influences and began to divide over various issues. Paul is writing this letter to address these issues and to encourage them in their faith. Paul is reminding them of the gospel he delivered just a few years prior when he writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. The Greek text actually gives us more information than our English translation here. The words that are rendered delivered and received in English are actually technical terms in Greek for passing on a sacred tradition. For instance, according to the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, the Greek verb paralambano means to receive in fixed form in the chain of Christian tradition. So Paul has indicated very clearly that what follows is not his own writing, but the tradition he had received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then the Twelve, that he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. The work of critical scholars confirms that this is an earlier oral tradition from several lines of evidence. First, it is organized in a stylized parallel form. The parallelisms are easy to spot, and they reveal that this is designed to be easily remembered and recited. The structure reveals this creedal formula. Lines one and three are parallel, both ending with the stylized phrase, according to the scriptures. Line two, that he was buried, is inserted in between to make an ABA formula. The same pattern repeats with parallelisms in lines 4 and 6. Notice how then by the 12 from line 4 parallels then by all the apostles in line 6, with he has seen by over 500 at once inserted between the parallel phrases. Another revealing line of evidence is the vocabulary of this creed uses words and phrases not found in any of Paul's numerous other writings. Now, if you're wondering what happened to the second part of verse 6, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, this is a parenthetical commentary by Paul. Paul was simply commenting on the tradition, letting his readers know that most of the 500 witnesses were still alive. Effectively, he is inviting them to investigate for themselves, Remember, Paul is writing this letter to a church that is having doubts. Paul is saying, you don't have to take my word for it. Over 500 people saw the resurrected Jesus. Most of them are still alive. Go ask them. People simply do not make public claims like this that are so easy to verify if they are concocting a legend. Now, New Testament scholar Craig Blomberg contends that if the crucifixion was as early as A.D. 30, Paul's conversion was about 32. Immediately, Paul was ushered into Damascus, where he met with a Christian named Ananias and some other disciples. His first meeting with the apostles in Jerusalem would have been about A.D. 35. At some point along there, Paul was given this creed, which had already been formulated and was being used in the early church. Now, here you have key facts about Jesus' death for our sins, plus a detailed list of those to whom he appeared in resurrected form, all dating back to within two to five years of the events themselves. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, it was probably formulated within the first two or three years after Easter itself, since it was already in formulaic form when Paul received it. We are here in touch with the earliest Christian tradition, with something that was being said two decades or more before Paul wrote this letter. Now, some of you might object and think that Christian scholars are out on a limb with this early dating. Not so. It's the scholarly consensus, even amongst skeptics. Consider the highly adversarial Jesus Seminar. 
These are scholars that voted only 18% of Jesus' words in the Gospels were actually said by him. In other words, these guys are not sympathetic to biblical accuracy at all. Even so, in the Jesus Seminar book, The Acts of Jesus, they date this creed at no later than A.D. 33. Moreover, scholar Gary Habermas observes that the independent beliefs themselves, which later composed the formalized creed, would date back to the actual historical events. Taken together, these considerations have led a broad spectrum of scholars from widely divergent schools of thought to identify this creed as eyewitness testimony of those who believe they saw literal appearances of Jesus alive after his death. As the Jewish New Testament scholar Pinchas Lapide concludes, this unified piece of tradition, which soon was solidified into a formula of faith, may be considered as a statement of eyewitnesses for whom the experience of the resurrection became the turning point of their lives.